Welcome to the Tradesman Channel. My name is Jim if you're new here and tonight we're going to be covering types of steels as a beginner blacksmith that you can find in your day-to-day -day life wandering around that would be good for forging and what projects they're actually good for. So you have some differences. You have your high carbon steels, you have your mild steels, you have your cast iron and it's kind of hard sometimes to tell what's what but there are some things that you can do to check it. So tonight we're going to get into what these steels are so stay tuned, I'll catch you on the other side of it. So the first steel out of the gate we're going to show you, this is a mild cold rolled steel. This is just off of the small shaft material. Steels like this are great for making your uh, great for making your tongs, easy to work with, you don't have to worry about heat treating, but they're not any good for edge tools. Now you can make your axe and hatchet bodies and tomahawk bodies out of mild steel like this and then you could forge weld a tool steel bit into those or chisels same thing you can just forge weld something in so these are good to work with um, I've made some tongs here on the channel before using this stock exactly so that's your first one now you can find this a lot if you're in uh, a lot of junkyards or steel steel yards places like that scrap it's pretty easy to get a hold of this stuff. It's great for most of your projects if you're not looking to make edge stuff. Next one down the bat, this is a very high carbon uh, die steel. This would be A11. And I got a bunch of this from a paper mill that I do a lot of work at. This stuff, it's very high carbon content. It's very hard to work with, very hard to pound out. But it's just one of those things where I came across a pile of it and I figured what the heck, we'll grab it. We'll test it out. Next down the list, this is a jackhammer bit that you guys saw me forge out a uh, drift with now well, about a year and a half ago or two years ago now I guess for doing small hatchets and things like that, a drift for the eyes. This stuff is very hard to work, it's very hard to pound, you need to get her nice and hot. Heat treating is a little different, it's not too bad, I believe this is an S7 steel if I remember right. But uh, this is really good stuff for high impact. So as far as for drift material, this stuff is absolutely perfect. Probably my favorite steel to work with. This is a 1080 steel. It's very forgivable in the heat treat. I go around to the DOT buildings and this is actually a piece of cutting edge off of the, uh, like the DOT snow plows. Now if you hold these all up next to each other, and you just set them down and you didn't know what they were just by looking at them you can't tell what kind of steel that is or even if it's worth a damn for your forging if you're depending on the job you're trying to do with it so let me show you guys how we actually test this stuff out now, a lot of people talk about doing a spark test when they're talking about testing steels so the higher carbon content in the steel the more of the the sparks are going to look like uh, uh how do i word it kind of like stars sparking off the end of them. Now if you're getting into something like iron or wrought iron, you're not going to get that big sparkle at the end of your sparks. It's just going to look like grains of kind of orangish. The higher the carbon you go, supposedly the more sparks are going to kind of explode a little bit. I know I have trouble wording this, but you'll see what I mean here in a moment when we get on the grinder. I don't usually do this test when I'm testing steels. I have a much a much better tried and true method that works for me but it might get you in the ballpark it'll at least get you to tell the difference between steel and just your regular iron because there's a big difference in that remember iron usually does not have carbon added into it for the strength of it whereas your steels even mild steel has a certain amount of carbon now most of your mild steel is going to be a low carbon steel 
You start getting into the harder steel, they're going to have a higher carbon. And each steel has a different type of job to do. So say you have a, say a blower shaft on a big HVAC unit, which is more where my experience is, those are mild steel shafts. Now, if you, the harder something is, the more brittle it is. So you don't want something that's going to have a lot of torque on it. You don't want it to be super hard because over time it's either going to crack or it's going to shatter. And I have seen that happen on different stuff. But the mild, it's an actual tougher steel. So it has room to move. It has more flex in it. A little more, I won't say spring because that's really not the proper word for it, but it has more give in it. It's going to be able to take some of those loads that have high torque. Um, tractor PTOs, they're a little bit of a harder, a harder steel. They're actually good enough for making hammers and things like that. But they're hard enough steel because you need those splines on there so they don't strip out. If you made those splines out of mild steel, they'd strip out. Tool and die steel, usually pretty hard stuff, but it's also a lot harder to work. Jackhammer bits, they're usually like an S7 high impact steel. They're tricky to heat treat, they're tricky to forge, but they are great for drifts and making the tools that you need to make other stuff. So it's always something to look for. So if you have an equipment rental place that rents out jackhammers, stop in once in a while. Ask them to say, hey, you got any old beat up jackhammer bits? You're just going to throw in the metal bin. A lot of times they'll just give them to you. So that's one place you can look. So let's get to the spark test. We're going to start with mild steel. Then we're going to go to the A11. Then the S7 steel from the uh, jackhammer bit, and then we're going to go to the 1080 steel. All of them should have a little bit of a different pattern to the spark. Now the A11 steel, that's the only stuff I'm not too sure about. They're telling me where I got it, it's A11, but who really knows? The spark test will help us determine that. I'm going to try a different piece for the mild steel just because it's a little easier to hold. But So here goes with the mild. So this is no mild steel to me, so I know this isn't junkyard steel, this actually came out of a piece of half inch plate steel, but pretty good spark pattern on that. So there's definitely carbon in this. Now, part of the reason I'm doing the spark test, I usually don't trust it when I'm trying to discern between high carbon and just mild steel, but it at least help you pick between something that's like a cast iron or something like that, which I'm going to show you what the sparks from those look like also. So, first one mild steel, next we're going to hit the, uh, we'll do what they told me is A11 steel, we'll see, so that one's next. Now this one surprises me a little bit. This is actually a cutter head off of a paper cutting machine. And to be honest with you, those sparks, they don't look like a high carbon steel to me. So we're definitely going to have to do a little more research on this stuff and see what its properties are. Now I know this stuff is really high in vanadium, so it may, may be some different properties to this that I'm unaware of. I don't know much about A11, like I said, free stuff that was given to me. But I know it holds an edge, it stays really hard, and these things, they get used a lot. They just cut, they shear paper all day long. So, I'm a little more surprised on that. But this is why you do this stuff. Before you start forging something, you hate to waste your time on a project and not have it do what you want it to do. So next one up, we're going to do the S11 steel. Now there was a big difference in this stuff between this jackhammer bit and that supposed A11 steel. Had a whole lot of spark and a whole lot of sparkles off the end of them. Again, I have trouble deciding what words to use for that without sounding like a goofball. But this is definitely a high carbon content steel, or at least a carbon steel. Now you notice with just the mild steel, it has a pretty similar spark pattern to this stuff. 
So awful hard to test or tell just based on the spark test. Like I said, it gets you in the idea whether you're even dealing with steel at all. So the next one up, we're going to take this piece of 1080 steel. Now this is definitely a high carbon steel. Great stuff to work with. So let's get this one. So the, uh, the 1080 steel gives us a definite big spark pattern on that with the sparkles at the end of them. You know, somebody will help me out with that I'm sure. But that's definitely a good one. So let's see if I could find, I want to see if I could find a piece of iron kicking around this barn somewhere. I'm sure I must have something and I'll show you what that looks like on the spark test. To be quite honest with you, the supposed A11 kind of to me sparked a lot more like uh, iron than it did steel. So let's see what I can find. Well this one's going to be a little hard to hold. This is just a brake rotor, but this is a real good example of something you know, like a cast iron. a huge difference in between something like a cast brake uh, rotor versus the different carbon containing steels. Now when you put a when you put cast iron or wrought iron or anything like that and it's really hard to find wrought iron but when you put that stuff on the grinder it's just gonna be kind of a dull orange grainy spark. You're not gonna get the big sparkles at the end of them that you're gonna get with the steels. There again steel contains carbon that's what separates carbon from iron. You know, obviously steel's made with iron and carbon, but you get what I'm saying. And there's other stuff in there, manganese and all kinds of other stuff in the steels that gives it its different properties for tooling and, and things of that nature. Although I'm not a metallurgist, and like I said, I'm just a novice, so I'm kind of relaying what I do know to you guys without trying to sound like a nutsack know-it-all. So I'm going to take you to the next test that really works better for me than anything else, and basically... If you want to know if you have a steel that's good to uh, good to use for a knife or an axe, an axe bit or a hatchet bit, chisels, anything like that, really the best thing you can do, get it above magnetic, quench it, see if it file hardens, and then temper it down to see where you can get it. Now, if you're working with a steel you're not sure of, you should really take a small piece and do that anyway. It's like I said, you don't want to get to a project and have something come out really nice and then realize... It's never going to work for what you need it to. Now even uh, like files. Files are usually a 1095 steel. That one's a little harder to work. It takes the tempering process is a lot different for 1095 steel, the temperature wise anyway, than it is for say 1080 steel. So if you're getting into it, don't be afraid to experiment with some of that stuff and that'll kind of help you out quite a bit in your journey to learning how to do this stuff. Now you're going to see that this file bites right in. See how it doesn't skate? Definitely a mild steel there.
and bite. Well, there you have it, all my odd YouTube buddies out there. So I did this video in response to a question from a friend of mine who's just, he's fascinated into getting into blacksmith. He's starting to realize that in the world we're living in, it may come a point where you need to know how to make your own things. Just not even doomsday stuff, just a matter of common sense. If you have the space and the will to do it, why wouldn't you? Um, so I mentioned tool sources before. If you have a spring and alignment shop near you, that's a good place to go get steel, like 5160 leaf springs. Now you have to be careful of those because a lot of the newer leaf springs are not 5160 steel. They have different properties, not as good for what you'd normally make 5160 with. Um, 5160 though is an awesome steel. It's really good stuff. My favorite steel to use is the 1080 for the things I do, my draw knives and chisels and stuff like that. It actually performs phenomenally. Holds an edge really well. It's easy to work. It's a very forgiving in the heat treat. I don't do a lot with 1095, which is a lot of times is your files, just because to me the heat treating is a little more... I don't have a suitable oven for doing it properly, let's put it that way. Sooner or later we will get a heat treat oven, whether I make one myself or we buy one, but uh, that's definitely on the list. Um, mild steel... If you go to a lot of your scrap metal yards, a lot of times, if they're decent about stuff, they'll let you pick through the pile, and a lot of times you can buy it for scrap weight. It's getting harder to get steel for free because scrap metal is so it's so valuable right now. People don't like giving it up like they used to, but you can always find something somewhere. I'm fortunate enough to where I do work in a lot of places, factories and things like that, where they usually have a lot of hardenable steel in their scrap pile. And a lot of times, all I have to do is ask, and they know me well enough, sure, help yourself, whatever, whatever you want. You can take whatever you want out of the scrap bin. And that's worked out really well for me. Like I said, the other thing you could do, I can't stress it enough, for 1080 steel, your, your snow plow cutting edges on most of your DOT snow plows for your states, your counties, and your towns, they're usually going to be 1080 steel. They're usually going to be about half inch to 5 eighths inch thick. I get them in plates sometimes 6 feet long, 5, 6 inches wide, and they're, they just they replace them a lot. But there again, usually I just go in and I ask, hey, do you guys, what are you guys doing with that? Ah, help yourself. That's the hardest thing when you're getting into these hobbies is kind of swallowing your pride a little bit enough and just asking somebody what they're doing with something. That's how I end up getting most of what I get here, I mean, you guys know I'm cheap. I have a reputation for being very cheap, frugal, whatever you want to call it. But for me, if I can scrounge it, somebody's going to throw it out and I can repurpose it and save some bucks in the process, that makes me a happy man. Um, so be, be creative. Now, as far as the spark test goes, I've never seen that as a highly accurate way of determining my steel type because I don't have the practiced eye that maybe a lot of very experienced blacksmiths do. So I usually, my go-to test is throwing a piece of that metal in the forge, getting it above magnetic, getting it in the quench tank, and then see if the file will skate. I know with all the noise in here from the blowers running, it's kind of hard to hear what I was saying when I was showing that test, but... If you have a hardenable, high carbon tool steel, when you quench that, that file should skate across it. It shouldn't bite in. If you have a mild steel, if you have iron, the file's going to bite in. So that's something that's, that's really your best test. And like I said earlier, after that, it's not a bad idea to take a piece of that, throw it in your oven. If it's 1080 steel, you can heat treat it at 450 degrees right in your oven in the house. Your wife might not like it but mine's usually pretty good about it. And you can see how it tempers and see how it performs. Test it, sharpen it up a little bit. Try hitting it a few times on some things just to see what you get. I mean, a lot of times we get into these hobbies, these things we enjoy doing, and we expect perfect results from ourselves right off the bat, and we get discouraged if we don't get them, and some people, they'll just put it down and never pick it up again. But that's a terrible thing to do to yourself. This is an exciting thing to do. It's fun if you have a mind where you just like to make things, you'd like to stay occupied. You know, the most enjoyment for me is getting better at something. Starting into one of these 
trends or one of these hobbies or trades and just learning it. I like to learn things inside and out. I may never be perfect at it, and I don't care about that. I'm happy with the things I make, and I'm happy with the progress I make. Now, I'm a little rusty. It's been a long time since I've been in this blacksmith shop doing anything because it's just been so damn busy the last couple of years. But I'm making a conscious effort to get in here now, start making the tools that I kept talking about. I enjoy doing it. I probably... I like my woodworking, I like all that stuff, but the older I get, the more I'm enjoying tinkering with old machinery, tinkering with the forge, building the tools. I'm finding more fulfillment and enjoyment out of that. I still love my carpentry, I still like my woodworking, but not as much as I like this stuff. Um, I've got a lot of bow staves dried up, ready to go. Can't wait to get into those this winter, because I enjoy archery quite a bit. That's a side you guys really haven't gotten to see on this channel. I even like shooting a slingshot. That's a lot of fun. So I'm like a five-year-old at heart. So anyway, enough of my yak and I hope this was informative. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, I can't stress enough, I am not an expert. There's a lot of other channels who can explain this even better, but this might give you a basic idea of how to get going. So thanks for watching everybody and I'll catch you on the next one.